Welcome to graph theory lecture number one. So in this um, introduction to graph theory lecture, we will cover uh, three um, basic uh, topics. So the first one is, uh, it's a brief introduction to the notion of graphs. Uh, graphs are very useful, they're everywhere. Uh, so we will basically look at uh, the existence of graphs uh, in this world, how we use them. Uh, while you're here, you're here also to learn about graphs. So the second uh, topic we will go into uh, slightly uh, and slowly diving into the basics of graph theory. There is a whole lot to learn in graph theory, but uh, in this course we're going to we will cover um, the fundamental concepts and uh, baselines of uh, graph theory, graph representations, notations, examples, different types of graphs, etc. And in the last part, we will have just um, a flavor of the conception or the notion of the uh, gra of graph topology. What is graph topology? And it's, this is very important because it's the hallmark of graphs. What makes graphs different from images and uh, other data representations? Great. So graph theory comes at the intersection of these uh, three. Uh, big circles. The first one is maths, the second one I would say algorithms, and the third one is learning. So let's look more closely here. So I have um, highlighted or outlined the key things that we will cover during uh, this course, uh, hopefully. So first we will look at uh, graph notations, uh, mathematical properties, uh, Propositions and proofs, not a lot of that, but a little bit. So there is some mathematical aspect uh, to this course. Uh, graph topology is very important. I would say it lies at the heart of this course. Then we will look at algorithms like classical algorithms uh, that are graph-based or try to solve graph-based problems. So shortest path, for example, in a graph, community detection, graph diffusion and fusion techniques, graph spectral analysis, so all of these things, they're related to um, algorithms. And uh, the most exciting part, I would say, is the learning, uh, uh, the learning part, when, where we're using graphs to solve uh, learning problems or to do some learning on graphs or via graphs. So we will look at, um, at graph learning, different graph learning techniques, uh, factorization, embedding techniques, how we embed graphs in a low dimensional space. And at last, if we have some time, hopefully, we'll cover also graph convolution networks, which is a new field called geometric deep learning. And this is, you know, one of the hottest topics uh, nowadays. Okay, so here, as I mentioned earlier, so we have our uh, friend, the inquisitive bee. Whenever you guys see it, it means we have, uh, you need to think. So uh, our smart bee is uh, always self-quizzing, searching for optimal solution to complex problems. So I would like you to be smarter than a bee. So you guys are like, not this character actually, our smart bee. <laughs> okay, so um, the key things we'll cover during this uh, course, what is a graph, the fun fundamentals, uh, the fundamental basics of graph theory. Uh, we will look at classical examples like baseline, uh, uh, graph-based problems. Uh, also, we will learn how to design graph-based methods to solve real-world problems. Uh, and we will look into different uh, graph representations, not just the simple graph, but the hypergraph, the multigraph, the multiplex, the network. So all of these things that are rooted in graph theory, and we can use them to solve very exciting uh, problems. So the textbooks I'm using in this course are these three textbooks. So there is, let me just zoom a little bit. So we have the fundamentals of brain network analysis. Uh, this is really a great book uh, about graph theory, but the, uh, it, it presents all graph theory, basically co covers the main topics uh, with, some ap with application to the brain. But the theory is there, the algorithms are there, the math is there, learning, everything is there. Now there's another one which I really like too, it's quite nice and simple, it's called The Fascinating World of Graph Theory by uh, Benjamin Ch uh, Chartrand and Zen. 
And the last one is, uh, it's Graduate Text in Mathematics, published by Springer, and it's Graph Theory. So you guys have three textbooks, but uh, to not get lost, I would say focus on the first one. So I'll explain uh, more uh, in a bit. So how to get the most out of the lecture. So we brainstormed a little bit earlier about this. So uh, my advice to you was to first think about the solution before it's revealed to you. So this is like, uh, this course is based on uh, thinking about how to solve problems using graphs. So try to, uh, you know, model problems using graphs. So thinking and drawing and scribbling is a huge part of this course. It's very important that you write, you take notes, you think. Uh, the second point is um, self-quizzing. So self-quizzing has been proved to be very effective uh, in long, uh, long-term memory learning. Uh, so if you guys want to retain your what you're learning, so not after you pass your exams, it goes into thin air, uh, then you need to self-quiz. You always ask yourself questions. And this is not just, it doesn't apply only to this topic, but also uh, other topics. And I said, for example, if you want to define a directed graph, uh, you say a directed graph is a graph where, uh, for example, uh, two nodes have uh, two edges, one going in one direction and the other one in the opposite direction, then, uh, then this is a full definition, right? But if you want to apply self-quizzing, you would ask, what is, an und what is a directed graph? Okay, so you're turning uh, your sentences into questions. And the last one is taking notes by hand. So uh, there was a study by Mueller and, uh, um, and uh, co-authors in 2014. So it was quite interesting because I know we live in a digital world. Everything is digitized. We're like, we're, we like using uh, our computers to type, but actually using a pen to write, it seemed like it was proved to be uh, very uh, effective and efficient in improving your uh, learning. So here in this uh, study, they say the pen is might, mightier than the keyboard, advantages of long hand over laptop note taking. Feel free to have a look at this. Uh, I'm not saying that, I'm not completely discouraging you to not use your laptops. It's good. We love uh, technology, but what I'm saying is that when you're going home, back when you go home and you revise your notes, just try to write and create your own personal summaries. For example, okay. So uh, right. So here, for example, they say we show that whereas taking more notes can be beneficial, laptop note takers tend to transcribe lectures uh, verbatim rather than processing information and reframing it uh, in their own words is detrimental to learning. Okay, so great. I guess that was a brief intro. Now we can start with the first part, which is like um, graphs. So here I will give you an introduction where we're using graphs from bees to brain. So graphs are basically everywhere, okay? So a little bit of history. Who invented graphs? Who came up with the definition of a graph? It was, uh, if anyone doesn't know, so here's a little bit of a background. This was the first guy who uh, invented the word graph. To the best of our knowledge, of course, there might be some burned out manuscripts no one has ever read. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, according to history, like uh, uh, Leonard uh, Euler, like he was the one who came up with this uh, word, like he defined uh, a graph. He's a, look at his, this great man. He's like a mathematician, he's a physicist, astronomer, geographer, logician, engineer, and he laid back the foundations of uh, infinitesimal calculus and graph theory. So you can see people uh, in, in the old time, they used to do so many things at the same time and be so creative and successful. I wonder why we are different. That's another topic. Okay, cool. Now that, let me just explain the problem that he uh, outlined. Uh, so Euler basically, in uh, 1735, he lived in a city, and this city uh, is called um, Königsberg, which was built around seven bridges. And um, an unsolved problem around that time was whether it was possible to walk around the town via the route that crossed each bridge once and only once. Okay, so you want to have a like a route that uh, crosses the whole town, and you are allowed to use the bridge only once, each of those seven bridges. Okay, so that's the basic idea. And this is how the, how the town looks like. So these are 
the bridges, okay, so you guys can see them there. And the basic idea, I would like you to look at this and think about, okay, now I know maybe most of you don't know what, uh, don't know crafts, but uh, he looked at this picture, he drew it basically, schematized the, uh, the city and thought about, okay, how can I solve this mathematically? How can I uh, uh, find a route that uh, allows me to go around the city by crossing all these bridges only, uh, only once, okay? And these are actually the different parts of the city. So these are the starting points, the C, the A, the B, the D. Okay, great, so here is what he's done. So to solve this problem, he actually uh, thought about modeling these cities as nodes, okay, and the bridges that connect them, that takes you from one to the next one, the neighboring one, as edges. And this was the idea how basically the idea of um, a graph was introduced. And let's look at this. So this is actually the graph he defined for, uh, for the city. And you guys can see, for example, let's just follow this up a little bit. So if you want to go from uh, you want to go from node C to A. So from C to A, you need to cross either D or C. So you have two, two possible uh, bridges. Okay, so that's how he, he has uh, constructed that. Now, after that, uh, it turns out that basically uh, he, he modeled it as a graph and tried to solve it. And then do you guys think it's solvable? This is what he tried to prove, whether this is solvable or not. So he looked into that. And after looking into that, so I'm still talking about history and background, he basically showed that that in this graph representation, uh, it allowed him to prove that no more than two nodes uh, should have an odd number of edges connecting them to the rest of the graph, so for such a walk to be possible. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that if you have more than two nodes, okay, with an odd number of edges connecting them to the rest of the nodes, then this walk will not be possible, okay? And here, let me ask you, so we have our smart inquisitive B, so you guys, I would like you to think about it. Just read this, take some time, two minutes. So is it possible to find a route around uh, Königsberg city that crosses each and every bridge only once according to this property that uh, proposition that he derived so the question is how many nodes in this graph has an odd number of edges connecting them to the rest of the uh, graph? So for example, node D, okay, let's look at node D, how many edges it has? One, two, three. So that's an odd number, right? How many nodes have an odd number here of uh, edges? Yes, so we have three, five, and three. So all of them odd, right? So, and he said the condition is like no more than two. So you have more than two that have odd connections to other nodes. Okay, so for this reason, it's not possible to have that walk in the city. Okay, cool. So now, uh, this is what we call, like he said, like it's topologically uh, prohibited. So we'll learn about topology in a bit. What does it mean? So how can we use this proposition to build efficient smart cities? Now, if you were, um, I don't know, uh, an engineer, designer, uh, what do they call them? Architect is more, no, no, no. Civil engineer, yes, civil engineer, yes. How can you use this property to build a very effective city where you can easily have a, an optimal tour, like you can cross all the bridges in the city only once? What is the condition you should have in your, in your design? Guys? Yes? 
Very good. The condition, no more than two notes should have an odd number of edges connecting them to the rest of the cities. Okay, so if you satisfy in that criteria in your criterion in your design, then it is true. Okay, good. Now let's look. So here, just before I go next, uh, let's have a definition of a graph. So what is a graph? A graph is actually a pair of uh, two sets. One is called V and the other one is E. So it's the V is basically the set of nodes and E is the set of edges edges, or we call them also connections, connecting those nodes, okay? So here you guys know this, that each, every edge is a combination, uh, it connects two nodes, okay? So this is like, about, it's, a, um, it's a, a V squared at set, okay? Because you have an edge, for example, E1, connecting two nodes here, V3 and V5. So an edge is defined as uh, a uh, basically as a, a as a two element uh, set. Okay, so that's quite simple. Now what? Now let's come to this uh, nice question: What a node can represent in a graph, and what an edge or a connection can possibly represent in a graph? Think in terms of the available data, the problems that you want to solve, okay? So let's say, for example, here, I have uh, this graph, okay? And these are, okay, this is two, uh, let me just use another one. These are the edges connecting my graph. So what can this represent? So how many nodes I have in my graph? So this is quite simple, V1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, okay? Now what can a node represent in a graph? I want you guys to give me ideas, many ideas. A node can represent what? Sorry? People, a person. Data? Uh, try to think in terms of data. Cities, for example, it can represent a city, it can represent a person, it can represent what else? Road intersection. Sorry? Road intersection. Road intersection, yes. Location. Uh, it can represent location. You guys thinking about physical things, okay, like uh, not in an abstract manner. I like it. But let's think in a more abstract way, okay? So here, a node can represent one sample, for example. A sample can be anything, can be all these things. Sorry? The data? The node can be data? Entity. Yeah, huh, sample. Very good. So here it can be a sample. So we call a datum, right? Uh, users, for example. A user, for example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, or it can be like a Facebook user, a Twitter user. Very good. So it can be anything. But I would like you to think in a more abstract manner. Let me explain. So for example, here... A node can represent all of those things, but it can also represent, it can represent uh, a feature vector that you use to uh, encode a sample. So these are, for example, these values, they tell you things about your user or about the location or about whatever you want. It can be also, uh, each node can be also a, a set of nodes. So you can think about it as a set of samples. So here, a node can be a graph too, which is so cool. So you have a graph of a graph, right? So what I'm saying is you can store anything in that. That node can represent anything. It can represent, for example, a node can represent a neural network. 
architecture. A CNN, okay? Let me write it clearly. A CNN, for example, okay? And then how are you modeling the relationship between two CNNs? That's the question you need, like you would have to think about, right? So what I'm saying is that graphs can be used to model anything, okay? Now how you're defining the relationship is the most important part, right? How are you modeling the relationship between those uh, subgraphs, those samples? This is node one, another node between neural networks. So you need to think about that. So this is uh, one of the things we will learn during this course. Now, before we go ahead, let me just go through this. These are quite simple things, but you guys need to remember those. Like they're simple definitions, basic ones. So a graph with a vertex set V is said to be a graph on V. So this is how we uh, speak about, about graphs in terms of taxonomy. The number of nodes of a graph G is its order. So this is how we note it. So there are different notations, but this is a common notation, just one, uh, you know, two bars. The number of edges of a graph is denoted by a double bar G, okay? Uh, so here, a graph can be empty, so it has, it might be, uh, it might have no nodes, no edges. So this is an empty graph. A graph of order zero or one is called a trivial graph. Okay. So of order zero, what does it mean, guys? So the order is the number of nodes, right? If it has order zero, it means no nodes. It means we have zero nodes, so the graph is empty, right? So the graph is empty. Now, if we have order one, it means the graph has one node, right? So the number of nodes in the graph is equal to one. And these both cases are called trivial graphs, okay? Now, we have a vertex or a node. So when we say vertex, it means the same thing as a node. So these two terms are exactly the same, okay? A vertex node is incident, incident with an edge, E, if V basically belongs to E. So it means that E, the edge, is, a, is, is basically an edge at the node V, okay? Uh, two vertices are incident with an edge. Uh, if, if they are, it's end vertices, or we call it also it's uh, end vertices, uh, end nodes, or also it's ends, okay? Uh, an edge joins its ends, so it connects both its ends, nodes. Uh, the set of all edges at V is denoted by E of V. So this is, you know, the set of all edges centered at a node V. So if we have a node V here, and this is connected to uh, these other nodes. So these edges basically are E of V, okay? Now, uh, the vertices, uh, the two vertices are adjacent or neighbors, if VI, uh, VI and VJ uh, have an edge uh, that connects them. So basically, the, the set VI, VJ is, is an edge, okay? Two edges are adjacent if they share a node, so which means they have an end in common. And if all nodes of G are pairwise adjacent, it means that G is complete. What does this mean? It means like all your nodes are pairwise adjacent. So if you have a node, like, okay, it's too big. Let's see. If you have a node like this, it means uh, each node is connected to all other ones. Pairwise means this is their pairwise relationship, okay? So it means V1 is adjacent to all other nodes. So all of those. Also V2. So... Okay, and then let's say V3, and V4 is now fully connected. So this is a complete connected graph. 